five, four, three, two, one, and we're live. This is David, the Georgia photographer, and today I've decided to crank up a live screen. This is, I've come to call these my gorilla live screens, mainly because I want to just like turn one on, start talking to the camera and see who all joins in. It's not because... It's not because I'm particularly good at doing live streams, mainly. Man, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to do my stream. Looks like my audio is a little weak. Finally caught one. There's the bass angler. Is my is my audio pretty good? Is it coming through good? Let me know. I can't tell. It, the it shows audio level, but it doesn't look very strong. But. I have a new lens. You're a little loud. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'll just leave it be then. Um, at least I know that you're coming in. I was talking louder because it looks like it's just barely getting online. Ah, Jim Worthington. How you doing, Jim? Thank you for dropping by. I ordered this last week prior to going out of town for the weekend. And it came in while I was gone. Uh -huh. I've been shooting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to this in a second because of this. Um, I've been shooting all of my street photography with this little Leica CL and this antique 35mm f2.8 lens. And the reason, Hassan, hey, how you doing? Um, the reason, thank you for stopping by, Hassan. The reason I wanted to use this is I'm trying to standardize on my lenses. I've been doing a lot of uh, focal length hopping, for lack of a better term, on my CL, and it's I don't have a lot of continuity in my images because of that. And so I've decided to just settle on a focal length and use it all the time. And I've decided on 35 millimeter for the crop center, kind of because it works out to 50 on full frame, give or take a couple millimeters. But I got the, this is a vintage Leica, they call it an LMR, it's an F2.8. But these really old ones don't have a built-in lens hood, it snaps off, it's got a couple buttons on it, and you push in buttons. And to store it, you have to take it off, turn it inside out, put it back on the lens, and then there's a little slip-on cover that goes on it. Well, I got tired of having to dismantle all that, turn it around, put it together just so I can shoot. So my buddy, Keith, has a 3D printer, and he's got this rubberized material, look, it's flexible, and he printed this cover, I sent him home with the lens hood, and he printed a cover that slips right on, perfect fit, so now I've got the lens cover up for it, but it's F2.8, and I shoot a lot in low light, okay, enter figuring out if I want to go with a larger aperture or a better camera, ta-da! larger aperture but for pennies on the dollar i can experiment with this guy and i don't it doesn't break the bank this is the tt artisans 35 millimeter f1.4 and it's for a crop sensor camera it's actually the small little tiny 35 f1.4 now it's a full manual lens but who are we kidding here it's full manual um but I bought this lens from a camera shop in California, and it looks like it has never been opened. I think it's a brand new lens. They might have carefully opened it and put it back, but it looks to me like it has never been opened. So I thought I'll open it on a live stream and share it with you guys what it's like, because it's a pretty nice box. It's, they did it kind of like Apple does. It's the really heavy box. It almost looks like it's got a linen cloth cover on it. I can't tell if that's paper or cloth. It looks like it's a cloth-like material. It's really nice. So let's get this thing out of the box. But yeah, when it came in and it still had the seals on the ends of the box. Yeah, because it's got void markers. Now that I pulled it off, it, it's got, it says void all over it. Yeah, it's brand new. Interesting. All right. Then you pull the top off. But some camera camera shop in California had it on eBay. It was like $70. It was not all that expensive. It's tiny. Wow. 
Okay, it's got this little do not eat gel pack. One of these days I'll have to eat one so it tastes like. Of course, you got some literatures. I mean, what are they going to tell you to do? Turn the ring to focus, turn the other ring to make it bigger or smaller aperture. And in Chinese, nonetheless, the, the book is not the best quality. The, the binding was stitched and it didn't fully stitch. <laughs> it literally just fell apart in my hand. <laughs> okay. T.G. Arson, you need to up your book binding game. It's not super great. This this lens is written. Well, it says this is the warranty card. And it's, it's in dual languages. Okay. Probably like has a two-year warranty. All right. Let's get that out of the way now. <clears throat> this lens looked bigger on eBay. A lot bigger. <laughs> it's a teeny tiny little thing. But it's got a it's native L mount set up. They went ahead and put an L mount mount flange on it so that it would be a direct fit. Oh, it's got it's got a screw on front lens cap. I mean, the lens is well made. They got the element groups printed on it. They did that to the box too, didn't they? I thought maybe they didn't. It's on the lens. Let's see, is it clicked? Oh, barely. It's got aperture clicks, but I can barely hear them click. Man, they're subdued. It's good clear optics. I mean, it's a brand new lens. Bass Angler says, I've heard nothing but good things about their glass. I'm curious. I mean, at least it does. it's not a clickless aperture. It's a tiny little aperture. It's reminiscent to me of an M lens, as small as it is. But since it's crop center, it doesn't have to be very big. It's, it's all manual. You don't need the big body to, to cram focus motors and all that jazz in there. Let's see. Interesting. The hyperfocal distance scale is printed on the barrel. See it? And then if you, if you notice when you move it over, they've got the scaling range on the lens. But there's no reference markers to show you where or when. Oh, 4, 8, 11, 16. Okay, so you got tick marks. Let's see if I can get it to show up. See those tick marks? You got, apparently, the dot means F14. And then you got F4, F8, F11, and F16. And they've got reference tick marks on the barrel for hyperfocal scale. Interesting. Dude, this thing focuses down to a quarter meter. What is that? Like nine inches? It's got close focus. So, this is a Leica uh, F2.8 R mount lens. Let's set the camera down for a second. And this is a crop sensor L mount F1.4 lens. Uh, let's make it fair. Let's take the lens head off. <laughs> Look at that. So much smaller. Two stops a lot faster. That's pretty impressive. And it's a lot lighter because there's a lot less of them. Actually, yeah, it's a little lighter. Let me see what it looks like mounted. Yeah, it don't look too bad. Kind of looks right on the camera. Look at that. Yeah. Let's see. Well, the focus is in a good spot. It would be nice if the whole barrel was focused, was uh, knurled, or it had a wider band for the focus. I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it'll work. I ain't going to complain too much. But that gives me two more stops a lot at night. I've been shooting a lot in the low light, and the F2.8 forces me to do real slow shutter speeds to get exposure or run super high ISO. Oh, wow. Let's see. Yeah. Not bad. Focus is very shallow at this range. Man, you can hit focus, but you got to work at it. Scott Patterson, how are you? Good evening. But yeah, this is going to be my new little test driver. I figured what I'll do is I can drive this thing for $70 and 
And if I like the focal length, then I can actually start looking at maybe a more high quality manufacturer like a Voigtlander or a Zeiss or a Leica and get a 35 millimeter F14 in one of those. Once I prove out, then again, I may just use this if it produces beautiful images, like like Bass Angler was saying. Um, if it does a good job, maybe I'll just shoot it. But it's kind of a neat lens. I like the fact that it's nice and compact. Not super into this screw on lens cap idea. I mean, it goes on easy enough, but maybe I get Keith to print me out another one of them rubberized hoods. Gonna slip over this thing. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting little lens. I like how they got it all tapered in. It's pretty slick. But yeah, that's. This has been something I've been working on for about the past uh, a couple months now. When I go out in the in the street in Chattanooga or wherever I'm at, and I just walk around, I'll take this because it's a lot lighter. But it being crop sensor, when I put my 50 millimeter Summicron on it, it would you know it makes it so long that I wound up backing up a lot, and it's not bad. It's just. You know, it just takes more space to get photos, and sometimes I just don't have the space, and I kept running into that problem. You know, that's the beauty of 24 millimeters is you need zero space. You can just get right up on something and take a photo of it, but then you get distortion. So what's y'all's favorite focal length for just general walking around taking picture photography? Ollie, obviously, if I said that right, says, I thought you would get it since I saw you and your friend that had it. It's just too cheap to don't get. Kind of true. I mean, for brand new, I mean, brand new, it was $70 plus um, sales tax. It wound up being just under $75 shipped to my door from California. That's hard to beat. Is Keith an employee? If so, tell him printing you out another cap as conditions of employment. <laughs> yeah, he is one of my CNC machinists, but he has a, a pretty strong 3D print setup in his basement. It's pretty, it's pretty, he's got a pretty good many 3D printers. He's into it hard. I have my son that says, sorry, David, I missed the focal length and F-stop. Ah, this is the TT Artisan's 35 millimeter F1.4, but it's, scale down for crop sensor lint cameras it's it won't cover a full frame image and by doing that they can make it just teeny tiny look how little this thing is it's just microscopic the light's kind of hard to see and if i get it closer maybe that helps i don't know i i haven't done any like settings adjustments on the camera it's just for whatever reason it's dark but it don't look too bad to me. It looks a little ISO noisy. I got a light right here to illuminate me a little better. This here. I'm a zoom guy. I like 18 to 55. And that's a good photo length. That's basically what? 28 to 75 or something like that. If you scale it up to a full frame camera. So that's actually, it's actually kind of handy. But I end up on the long side anyway. So that's why, I, that's why I've been shooting primes here lately. I wound up. I noticed I didn't zoom hardly. You know, most of the time I don't zoom a lot. My son says, David, my absolute favorite focal length is 135, but my walk around between is 45 to 65. So you like a longer length. Interesting. I love the 28, is what Ollie says. 24 is often too wide and 35 is too narrow. So 28 is a nice compromise. On full frame, 28 is great. It really is. It, uh, it allows you to, like, be in close quarters and still get really good images. I noticed that. Scott Patterson said, I thought you sold that camera. No, sir, not this one. I like this one a lot. Duh. I've got it all doctored up. It's got this half case deal on it now, and that, and that and it this uh, case has a little gripper deal on it, and that makes it a lot more comfortable for me to shoot. Now I can hook them first digits on it, and it's it's really easy. And now, 
I've learned to work with it to the point where I only use, when I'm out shooting, I only use this button to enter ISO, then the wheel does shutter speed. The aperture, of course, is on the lens. And then for focus magnification, it's this up arrow right here. You just, and you just catch it with the first digit of your thumb. It just kind of rides on it there. You just like hit, pop it with your thumb. I mean, you can see, listen, you probably can't hear it. But I can just roll my thumb and click that. And then the shutter turns that off. So you have to press the shutter to get rid of it for compositional purposes. It's real easy for me to use. But I don't need a lot of external buttons. Like, I don't even use this button or wheel. This button, I think, is set to switch to movie mode on it. And I used it the other day to shoot a clip with, but that was the first time in forever. Um, and since I don't have a Leica L-mount lens on it or, you know, one of the L-mount lights auto lenses, this wheel does nothing. It's supposed to do um, aperture, but since I have a manual lens, it's dead. It just... Doesn't do anything, I don't think. I'm pretty sure it don't do anything. No, nothing. This one does the video, yeah. Now I've got this one set to where it'll do ISO in the center and shutter speed. Yeah, I thought I had it set that way. <laughs> Just confirmed all that. <laughs> there. I think he sold the TL. Yes, I did. I did sell the TL. I, I boxed it up with all that other stuff. When I got the, I think it was when I, when I bought the 500 millimeter phase Fresnel last fall. No, no, when I got the SL2 back in the spring. I sent all that stuff to you know, Robert's camera and the TL was in that kit, of, in that batch of stuff. Yeah, I like the TL other than with my aging eyes and it not having a viewfinder that you can focus. I was constantly like shooting, like looking through my bifocals to, to figure it out and it was hard on my neck. That's the only thing about that little camera I didn't like. Other than that, it was a great little camera. It took beautiful photos. I learned that platform shooting weddings. Nice. Uh, Bass Angler says, Dave can shoot straight. He took me to school. LOL. So I did not stick with birds and prey. Oh, uh, come on now. We were just out having fun. <laughs> we... We went to Dollywood yesterday to go to the Artisans Festival. Uh, I got a few photos. I, I'm going to put a video together with them in it at some point. But I took a few photos. But there was another photographer there. And he. it rained in the afternoon. About 3 o'clock, a shower moved through. And he was out there shooting water reflections in the daytime. And he was right down there on top of the water to get those reflections. And he looked like he was probably going to get cool photos out of the deal. I was too lazy to get down the ground. <laughs> Scott says, every camera is good if you enjoy using it. The truth. Yes, it is. Doesn't matter who makes it. It's like I said at the end of my videos. You know, get your camera out no matter who makes it and go take a picture with it. Because if it's your favorite camera, it's the best one. Are you ready to sell that old beat up 500 face wrestling yet? Nope. <laughs> I would be more prone to sell the 200 to 500 before I would that 500 face fresno. That's my that's my wildlife lens now. It and the Z50. That it's like that's like peanut butter and jelly, dude. Those two cam that camera lens just go together so well. Since I got the focus mode figured out on it to where it focuses good. It was it was real sluggish when I first started messing with it, and I think I, was, I think I had one of the modes set wrong, and I went through and cleared all that out and, and reset it and started over. And when I did that, it got peppy. It'll focus quick now, but yeah, I'm not selling that lens anytime soon. That and I, I like it on my D810 as well. It's it's really fast focusing on the D810. Hassan saying, David, you got to try the Sigma 45 f2.8 for the L mount. A sweet, sweet gem of a lens. It has a clicked aperture and a focus ring. Interesting. And it's an L mount lens. And it has an aperture ring. This is getting more interesting by the second. Gary, how you doing? Thank you for coming to the live stream. Yeah, this... I have to apologize to you guys again because 
I don't ever announce these streams. I just turn them on and see what happens. And that's got to be like the worst possible way to do a live stream. But yet, here I am doing one. <laughs> Let me see if I can get this light focus a little better. Ooh, that was that changed things. Look at that. <laughs> How about we turn that back like it was? <laughs> Let's see. That helped. Yeah, I'm just mildly overexposed. I go to about here. It looks about right. It's funny how I can index the light and get rid of the get rid of the hot spot. Look at that. <laughs> I got a big umbrella light right here beside the computer. I'm I'm streaming with the webcam on my old Mac. And I brought in a studio light. Well, it's an LED panel and I've got it um, I've got a collapsible umbrella diffuser in front of it to to soften it. But yeah, <laughs> let's see i'm missing something i gotta catch up on the comments they're right down here let's see they're really right here <laughs> um I guess. isn't the Leica lens what makes Leica so desirable yes and no the lens lenses have amazing characteristics and they have a feel and that's what this one is and it has it has real really cool characteristics and and it produces interesting images they they have a look to them they actually do there's a thing uh, you know they call it the like a look and it's legit that that's a thing but let's see i don't know where the mic's at on this thing is it up here i see yeah the aperture clicks are literally like snap into location. They, there's, they're not mushy. They don't jump out. That one, that new lens is a little mushy. Super light clicks. I mean, this one's loud. You know, you can hear it. But it's, it, but I mean, it's absolute. And this lens is over 50 years old. This is a 1966 model lens. And then the, the focus is still just buttery smooth on it. And it's 50-something years old. This is a beautiful piece of equipment. This is an R-mount lens. That's why it's got this adapter. There's the actual lens. But the R-mount cameras are um, an anomaly for Leica, just to be honest with you. But this is F2.8. And the reason I got this TTR was to get F1.4. And I... I was saying earlier that I bought this because it was only like $75 shipped to my door off of eBay, and it'll let me test drive F1.4, and the, the images will probably be soft. I mean, it's $70. So I, I don't expect, you know, super tack sharp images in the corners because it's $70. But it will let me shoot in super low light. That's the main reason I got it. I shoot a lot of my street nowadays in the evenings or at night, and I want to experiment. I want some more light gathering. And this little camera at, at ISO 6400 is pretty grainy. You know, and, that, and that's kind of cool if you're in a grainy, you know, if you're in a film grain kind of look stuff. But I just wanted to be able to lower my ISO a couple of stops, so I needed more light. And that was the only way to get it. That or lengthen the shutter speed. And... You know, once you're already down to about one fiftieth of a second, you're starting to get a lot more motion blur in your images and things. So, this is mainly for light gathering. Oh, it's got a half stop between f one four and f two. It's got a half stop click detent, then a half between two eight and two, half to four, and then five six eight and sixteen. It it jumps from eight straight to sixteen. <laughs> It's a non-linear aperture, too. See if you can see it. There's F1.4, F2. Notice how much space there is between them. And then that, the space to F2.8. And then look at the space from, from F4 to F16. It's, a, it's basically the same as F1.4 to F2. That's interesting. All that's probably to save money. They don't have to, like, gear drive it or anything to get a consistent uh, rate of movement. They just mark it and carry on. That's kind of cool. Let's see. Make sure I ain't missing something. Hey, Gary. 
you know, Miss David giveaway to <laughs> Oh, Bass Angler says, I already have the two to five hundred, though. Come on. <laughs> Gary says, I never get anything free. <laughs> Check out Two Blind Men and Elephant review of the Sigma L mount contemporary lenses. He compares them very favorably to Leica. Wow. Especially the 92.8 and the 45.28 and the 224 millimeter. Cool. And I haven't watched one of Hughes' videos in quite some time. It's kind of like he quit making them for a little while and he quit showing up in my news feed on YouTube. I would always watch them when I'd see them in the feed. A lot of times I listen to them because, you know, he's got that real soothing dialogue. It's a scripted video, kind of like Sean Tucker and all those guys and Jamie Windsor. They're, they all do the scripted videos. But I like to listen to his because his, his whole voice is real soothing while he's talking. I'll, I'll look it up and see. The 65 F2 is awesome. That'd be a pretty cool lens. That's that's right there at the 85 F2 area. Hold that thought, Hassan. You could get the 58 as a .95 nickel. <laughs> I could. I could buy that behemoth. It's about the same price as the uh, 50 millimeter Apo Sumicron from Laka. I talk about that in a video coming up too, but it's interesting. Um, <laughs> Gary Arbuckle says, I have a buddy who shoots Nikon, Fuji, Leica, Hasselblad, and I can always spot the Leica glass shots. They have their own look. It's hard to explain. It's just clean. Yeah, there's something about it. There really is, and and then people have people figure it out on my Instagram. If I post a photo on Instagram, they can figure it out by just looking at it. I don't know how, but they do. Eric Farmer, how you doing? Thank you for stopping by. Long time no see. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've got word yet, but um, Cuban Rum, who frequents our area and has a, he has a, a channel he messes with. Um, he, I think, had gallbladder surgery today. So if you guys could keep him in your thoughts and pray for him if, you, if you're a praying person because he could sure use it and he would appreciate it. Um, but yeah, everybody else I know of is doing pretty well. Phil Thatch got his uh, photography credentials basically to shoot uh, UTK sports and shot well if y'all if y'all are on the georgia photographer gathering y'all seen some of the photos he shared he shot a soccer match the other day right at dark and the sky is it's the the sunset the sky's on fire orange and reds and yellow and clouds and then the the soccer fields is in blues and greens and the the photos are epic <laughs> they're really cool photos thank you hassan but yeah, he's been, he, he went in the hospital, he said, because he suddenly had real, a real sharp pain in his abdomen and they done a bunch of tests and said they didn't, they didn't see anything actually wrong and he was suffering real bad. So they done a bunch more extensive tests and figured out, I guess his gallbladder went bad. They didn't find gallstones, but they, but they did surgery today. I haven't heard from him. I'm assuming he's probably either sleeping or super stoned. But uh, after the stream's over, I was going to talk to him a little bit if he was capable of it and see how he's doing. And uh, but everybody else I know of is doing okay. I don't know of anybody else having any serious issues currently. I saw those photos really, really well. Thank you, Hassan. Yeah, I post. There's a there's a little inside joke. If you if you watch my Instagram, you'll see that I post pictures about a couple of certain restaurants fairly often, and uh, or it comes up in my feed regularly. And it, one of them is Kenny's on the South Side in Chattanooga, and I post those photos, and then I'll tag Kenny's on the South Side, and then they'll reshare them. Typically on their um, what's the video thing on Instagram called Stories, and you know, and they tag me in their little story, but 
I normally will try to get some kind of an epic banger photo of something in their restaurant and then share it and tag them in it. But Sierra's boyfriend, August, works at Kenny's, and so I go in there and harass him a little bit and drink some coffee. <laughs> they got pretty good coffee. If you're if you're in Chattanooga for breakfast or lunch, Kenny's on, on Market Street's a pretty cool place to eat. And just I'll just throw that out there if y'all have if y'all are ever in the Chattanooga downtown area and you're looking for something for lunch it's good grub it's good stuff harry burnett 35 to 50 yeah okay thank you harry let's see bass angler says what like a zoom was it that the snap chick was using a while back the video I saw that I think you sent to me was the 90 to 280 super telephoto. Laka doesn't have anything L mount past 280 millimeters natively. You can get a 2x teleconverter from Laka and turn that into what is that? Uh, 560? No, 1.4 tele. It works out to like 420 millimeters if you put a teleconverter on that lens. You can rack it out and get like. A little over 400 so i guess that's a 1.4 teleconverter because you can't get over that natively from Leica. now you can get the sigma was it 150 to 600 in the l mount and it works fine supposedly if you want to run that lens on your Leica cameras but but yeah they've got that and then i think she's also done a review on the 24 to 90 intermediate focal length zoom and I, if you watch, uh, once you once you mess around with like a cameras, you find for some reason YouTube listens to you think and it knows you know the word like a, so it starts giving you like a content. <laughs> and you know, there's more going on there than meets the eye. Well, I got I found a group of guys called the Red Dot Forum, and it's a couple of guys that that one of them owns the store. I'm pretty sure, and one of them works at the store at the Laka store in Miami. And they do a they do like a two hour YouTube live stream once a month or so, and they'll talk about different things. And they talked about the lack of zooms and the way they the way they explained it. If I'm remembering correctly, I'm kind of paraphrasing a lot here because it's been a while since I've seen the video. But they did 24 to 90 instead of 24 to 70 to begin with because that covers all of the typical primes that people use up to 90 millimeters. Because they, do, they don't do an 85, they do a 90. And that's their portrait photo length. Or their, they do a 75 and a 90. They don't do an 85 that I'm aware of. But they probably have one in the R mount. Because they got everything in R mount. But, but yeah, that gives you the 24, the 28, the 35, the 50, the 75, and the 90 primes are covered with that one lens. And, and that's the way I understood it. But then they started at 90. And went to 280 millimeters with their with their what we would consider a 70 to 200 to do to do that next level up, and I guess to do it a little better. I don't know, but that lens is incredibly expensive. That 90 to 280 is like six thousand dollars. Those things are crazy expensive, but it's an awesome lens. Oh yeah, it's a it's a crazy good lens. The optical quality on all of that SL glass is just insanity, especially the primes. They set like benchmarks with those primes. I would really like to have that Sumalux 50 SL, that 50 millimeter f1.4. That's supposed to be like the sharpest prime ever invented or some crap. Let's see. Thank you, Q. Thank you, Bass Angler. Silver Fang, how you doing? Thank you for stopping in. Got to pay attention to the chat more. Let's see. Ali Avi. Avsi. Am I saying that right? I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. But it's Ali something. Um, it, looks, it looks like Avsi. It's either Avsi or Avki. Avki. One of those two. Um, I just don't want to butcher your name. He says, those New Zealands, especially the wide ones, have a more sterile look than some of the Sigmas. I don't like it. Yeah, there's a, 
And there's people that will say that about the new SL lenses from Leica. That, and the Canons. The new Canon uh, RF lenses are the same way. That with, with the aid of computer design and computerized manufacturing, that they're getting the optical performance to the point that it's so perfect that it creates a sterile image. And I'll come back around to this and go over it one more time in a minute. But that's a that's a pretty common thing nowadays. Uh, HVAC just cycled on. I didn't think I'd need it. I guess it's the heat. Uh, it ain't cold or hot. So it's fine in here. But at least Leica doesn't mind some chromatic aberration and other flaws to get that specific look. Also, Leicas are not as sharp as modern lenses, again, to get that look. And there's truth there. Now, the SL stuff is, is a little bit different. But when you go to M's, all the M glasses, like you say, um, it, uh, except the Apo, the Apo versions of the primes, that Apo means apochromatic. And that means they've hand aligned the elements to eliminate chromatic aberration as much as humanly possible. But yeah, like this old boy here, this lens has character. It does. And, and it's interesting. Indirect sun, it's not the greatest lens. It really ain't. It's, it, there is some pretty heavy chromatic aberration at times with this guy. And I'm going to guess this one does too for the price. If this don't have chromatic aberration, it's a steal. And everybody go buy one. We'll find out pretty soon. I won't get to shoot with it at least until Friday of any serious consequence. I'll play with it a little bit tonight, but I won't be going anywhere today or the next day or the next day if I'm right. So if y'all want to catch me at home, next three days is the day to do it because I'll pretty well be here. <laughs> Let's see here. This video is in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. That was the 90 to 280 that I saw that one was where she went down to San Francisco. Ollie says, you pronounce it Ollie. Aldi. 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 Is, is it Aldi? Aldi? Tell me if I said it right. Aldi? I'll stop there, and that way when you say yes or no, I'll know if I said it correctly. So Hassan says, okay, good. At least I didn't butcher it as bad as I could. Because I, I got, rumor has it, I got a pretty thick southern accent, so. <laughs> Let's see. Ali Abji. No. Hassan says, definitely heard that about the new Canon lenses, too clinical. Some of them are. And, and the, honestly, the Z lenses, a lot of them Z primes are that way. They're just, they're technically as perfect as computers can make them. They're just, it's just the way it is. I mean, they, it, technology is advanced to the point where if you need technically perfect photos, there's a company making lenses that you can afford somewhere that you can get one and it'll do it. I mean, it's just impressive. <laughs> and the next week or two, there's a video coming that you guys will see. I don't mind sharing my future content with you because it's coming out anyway. But I got a little, um, one of those Jupiter 80s or whatever. Um, but it's the 50 millimeter, I think it's an F2. Might be an F2.8. I don't remember exactly. But it's a little USSR made um, M42 thread mount lens. It's a little tiny thing. That thick, about that big around. It's about half. It sticks out off the camera about to here. It's just this teeny tiny little lens. And it's got some real interesting character traits. It's a. It's got some, I guess the word, it doesn't have haze. It's. It might be hazy may have a little haze in the lens but it's super low contrast and you know you can easily just slide the contrast slider open and adjust a curve and bring some contrast into the image so i didn't really mind it being low contrast but that lens wasn't but like 30 bucks or 40 bucks it was super cheap and the main reason i bought it is because it was made in ussr i mean the ussr hasn't existed since 1991 that was what 30 years ago is when the USSR fell. 
So I thought that's a pretty cool little piece of history. So I grabbed that lens off eBay. And like I said, the review's coming. It's a neat little lens. But I didn't like the way the aperture's on it. The aperture's on the front. And it's kind of a, it's kind of like this uh, filter retainer on this one. So there's a... I know I got stuck. All right, that's... There's a little ring on this one that's on the very front. That, and you you'd put drop-in filters and screw this back in, it holds them in. Well, on that little Jupiter or whatever, this is this would be the aperture ring on that lens. And it's just, it's a pain. It's clickless, so it's real hard to, like, you know minimum and maximum, but you don't know. I think I just got a big fat fingerprint on my lens. But... You, you have to just stop what you're doing and look at your lens to see what aperture you're at because, you know, you can't count clicks or anything. And like this one, it's non-linear, so it's kind of a pain. But and it was really easy to bump it and move it. And that was another thing I didn't like about it. It's like your arm would brush up against the front of the lens a little bit and catch that corner and it'd spin the aperture and move it. It was constant trouble. Randall Brander, hey, how you doing? Thank you for stopping in. Glad you're here. Let's see. Um, yeah, I'll G. Okay, Ollie. Ollie says yes. Okay, okay, that means I got your name right. Good. <laughs> yeah, awful. Even the Z40 F2 that is not that sharp and has some flaws. Interesting. That is interesting. I haven't I haven't laid hands on one of those either. Someone someone was pushing me a little bit towards that one because that works out to about sixty millimeter, you know, field of view ish. It's kind of a nice focal length. I got that f two point eight d sixty millimeters of macro lens. I put on my d eight ten. I did a whole trip up the eastern seaboard. We started in New York, went all the way to Canada, and then flew home from Maine. We kind of then drove back down to whatever the capital of Maine is, Bangor, I guess, and then caught a flight back home from there. But I did that whole trip pretty much with that 60 millimeter f 2.8. It, it just worked so well on that on that D810 for just general photos. I took a couple of other lenses, but I never really got them out. Bass Angler says, smash that like button. Yeah, if you haven't done that, do that. Runaway at large. Good evening. Just saw this and was searching for stuff about the CL. CL. Look at there. CL content coming up. <laughs> what I'm talking about tonight, the reason I cranked up the stream is I got this little TT Artisans 35mm uh, F2 or F1.4 lens and the L mount, so it's native mounted for the CL, so I could experiment with F1.4 apertures for a reasonable amount of money. Because this lens brand new is only like 75 bucks. And I got this one on eBay. Some camera shop had it in California, and they were asking $75, and but they had the make offer button. So I made them, I made them an offer of 70 even, and they had free shipping. Well, eBay charges you a fee now. I think it's a sales tax internet tax or something so it wound up being just a touch under 75 dollars to my doorstep and it's brand new i literally haven't taken a photo through it yet yeah but it has a little metal lens cap i'm not super on super into that but it goes on easily enough but the filter thread is super shallow it's deep enough you can mount a filter if you wanted to but it's a neat little lens 39 millimeter filter thread smart right there they even use the same text as Leica. Look at that. Now, let's see here. I can get it around. It. Well, the R mount stuff, you can kind of see it on the te on the numbers. You can see it's the same it's the same text as the newer the newer Leica lenses look just like that. They use that same font. <laughs> That's kind of cute. They serial numbered the lenses. It's 75 bucks and they put a serial number on it. That's kind of funny. I guess if you have some kind of recall problem, you can know the serial number range that way. That's interesting. Let's see. I think it's Augusta, the capital of Maine. Maybe it was. We just we went to the it was a, it was a city in kindly the center of the state, 
and they had a uh, big enough airport we could get a flight to Atlanta and then back to Chattanooga. They, if you fly Delta, doesn't matter where you go, they'll fly you to Atlanta and then put you on a commuter back out to the littler cities near it. And so I'm pretty sure that's how we went home. Runaway at large says, I'm interested in the CL as a potential backup for my Q2. And it's good. It's good for that. I don't have a Q. Um, I have messed with one a little bit. Cuban Rum has a Q. Nice cameras. Uh, it's interesting what you can do with just a 28 millimeter lens. It's it's a really nice machine. With a, I don't know that I would have picked 28, but I kind of understand why they used it. But I think 35 would have probably been what I would have lobbied for had I worked at Leica and they were on the development team for that camera. I, I, I don't know. I guess 30, 28 just seemed like the right one for them. But lots of people like it. <laughs> yeah, he says, ah, good old Chinese attitude to copyright and passing off. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the same exact text. I mean, yeah, you can see it on the on the camera here. You can see the text, and then you turn it around. It's the same font. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. You can tell what crowd they're catering to with that very clearly. <laughs> Gary Arbuckle says, David, you ready for the Z9? If it, is, if, it, if it doesn't have housefly auto eye focus, I don't want it. <laughs> Seriously, it looks great. I'll have to sell a lung. <laughs> oh, because <laughs> a kidney won't buy one. <laughs> Hmm, but yeah, that's a, that camera, if it performs as much as like, well, Matt Irwin is hyping it to, to do, then it's going to be a monster. It'll straight be a D6 killer. That's for absolute certain. And from the way they're talking, they're hinting at a global shutter because they're saying that it has no, no, um, what is that warping you get when you take a photo with the electronic shutter and it does the whole distortion on it. it ain't banding it's a different word um, I don't remember what it's called now but you one of you will tell me but it doesn't do that they're saying they're not they're not having that trouble with it so you wonder if if the Z72 has two of those processors in it this thing's probably got four it's got to have to pull that data in that quick Always says the jelly effect. Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole warpy deal where, yeah, I don't remember what it's called, shut or something. But <laughs> rolling shutter. There you go, Bass Angler. Thank you. doesn't have rolling shutter, and it doesn't have a mechanical shutter. Is what the rumors are, is they've eliminated the shutter mechanism completely. And it has a dust cover that closes over the sensor, that looks like a shutter, but it's simply a dust cover, which is good because then if you screw it up and damage it and you can get it open, the camera will still work. That's a good point. No mechanical shutter is what Gary said. They're getting to the point where they don't need it. And once you get a global shutter, you know, you get the, you get the processor speed fast enough that you can just pull the data off of the sensor in a single pull instead of having to scan it and read it in lines. Once you can do that and just draw that data stream straight off the back and process it straight into memory as a, as a global read, at that point, you don't need one. You just read it uh, in the time that you tell it to. You know, I want to do it in 150th of a second. Okay, wait 150th. Now I'll pull that data. And I can see that that they're getting to that point. Maybe that's what Nikon's doing. They're just like, keep adding processors until we can do that. You know, there's what, four? How many XP7 or whatever processors does it take to do that? You know, and because they needed to bring something. I mean, they've been playing catch up for a couple of years now, and everybody knows it. You know, they they haven't been they haven't been showing off with new developments like they used to. That's 
that's how I could word that. Randall Brander says the lens sensor is double coated. That's interesting. It's supposed to be a stack sensor too, the way I understand it. Another D3 moment is what Gary said. Yeah, I, I think it if it if it performs as good if it performs 80 percent of what these teasers are getting people to believe and here we are talking about it right now in the stream if it if it does 80 percent then it's a home run for them because i mean with the autofocus and it's a home run for all knock on shooters too there's the next magic because you get the trickle down you know the d500 got the D5 um, focus system. That's why it had the best focus of any of their mid-range DSLRs because the D5 produced the best autofocus there was and then they put it in the D500 and scored a home run with that camera. Ask Bass Angler. Thing's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it says... Runaway at large says, oh man, I can't wait for the A7 IV. There's going to be a shutter curtain over the sensor when you when you switch it off. And you can, can change the lens without getting that much sensor dust like I do with my A7 III. Yeah. I feel your pain, brother. You would think that these guys would figure that out. If you're listening, like a and Wetzler, we would like the dust cover idea. I mean, wouldn't be a hard firmware update. Just saying, maybe even have a lens change mode. If you don't want the shutter to stay closed all the time, and you just want to do dust protection, you could you could like hit a button and and pull the shutter down, switch the lenses, turn the camera or hit the shutter or something, and reset it. I mean, it could be done with firmware pretty easily. Now, I understand the shutter is fragile, and it may be that you really don't want to risk even wind blowing on it because those little Teflon blades, are they're fragile. You don't touch them at all. So maybe that's why they don't. I don't know. It's the anti-lacing filter that's double-coated. Okay. Okay, I got to catch up. You guys are talking. Wolf Tick's here. Hey, how you doing? Not sure if it'll be a D3 moment, but I hope so. Yeah, if it does everything. There it is right there. Striking seven bells. This other one in a second. They were synced the other day, and now they've run off from each other. In the spring and fall, this one slows down and speeds up. In the winter, this one runs on time. There it is. <laughs> but this one in the summer runs just a hint fast um, supposedly it has to do with humidity and temperature the parts grow in the summer so everything gets a little bigger slightly so the pendulum grows in length which should slow it down technically but also the, the internal parts change size because of thermal expansion the metal, the metal gets bigger in the summer very slightly, but it does. It's interesting stuff. Let's see. The AA filter is what's double coated. Interesting. Randall Brander ooh, ooh, says the 100 to 400 plus the FTZ2 with no bump. Okay. So, yeah, I know that the FTZ with that little tripod mount on it is kind of a headache. But I really wanted the FTZ2 to be to drive AFD lenses. I, I so wish they had done that. There's so many of those lenses I like to use. That's frustrating. I have the the 50 millimeter f1.4 AFD. Great little 50 mil. I even did a video here a while back on my D810 with it. It's a wonderful little lens. Screw drive focus. <laughs> frustrating guys knock on if you're listening if, if somebody shows this video to knock on fast forward to this point to 54 minutes into the stream and show them we want the ftz 
with the screwdriver focus motor. It's something we want. <laughs> if you make it, we will buy it. <laughs> They'll sell out immediately if they release them. Immediately. Ah, that's frustrating. <sighs> Wolf Dick says, I'm actually kind of worried about the double coating. Most AA filters impede on sharpness. Yeah. They'll fix it in camera. They did, they're did. they using software to fix some of the issues with the Z-mount lenses already. It's been proven. Uh, what's his name? Um, Taipei Geek done, done, some, done some research with the Z-mount glass and found out that they have um, they have distortion in the edges and stuff on a bunch of them, and they fix it all in camera and firmware. It's all it's written into the camera's firmware to do auto lens corrections. So they'll probably do some of that in there too. Which, as technology improves, it wouldn't surprise me if it didn't have it if it if they didn't put an AA filter in it. I mean, it would it would greatly surprise me if they. Put one in there that made the images less pristine. Because it's got to one-up the Z7 II. If it don't do that, nobody's going to want it. I mean, you can get a Z7 II for half the money and the images are twice as crisp. I mean, yeah, that, that'd be an epic fail on their part if they did that. Runaway says, oh man, that's why I got the Q2 all fixed lens and sealed up. Yeah. Yeah, that that dust, I have to clean it about once a month, give or take. I've gotten to where I blow it out about once every two weeks or a week. If I change lenses a lot, I'll just blow it out with a rocket air just to get the big pieces off. And if I don't stop way down, they don't show up unless I got a little blue sky, you can see dust. But it's dusty now. But most of the time, if I'm shooting city scenes, you can't see the dust spots. So I don't really worry about them anymore. I used to worry on center dust a lot, but and occasionally I'll, once every, like I said, once every month, maybe two months, I'll actually clean it properly because at some point you get them little fibers on it from something. I don't even know what they're from, but you get one of them and you got this little squiggly in your picture in and you got to fix that, but just a couple of dust specks. I don't really worry about them anymore. Especially if I'm shooting wide open, you can't see them. Gary says, rumor has it the Z9 software will trickle down to the Z6 and 7 Mark IIs. There ain't no rumor there. It will. There'll be firmware updates that'll hit them cameras, and there'll be you'll get goodies from the Z9 into them cameras from that. It may be it may be hobbled back a little because like I said, it will. It wouldn't surprise me if you get a new processor that's faster than the one in the Z7, and they put two of them or four of them in this camera, because to read that shutter that fast and to not have a mechanical shutter in there is going to be. It's got to read at blinding speeds. I mean, insanity speeds, so you don't get rolling shutter. There's, I mean, that's just the way it is. Ollie says, whoop, whoop, I'm going to run past Ollie. I'm just waiting on the new FTZ with the silent stepper autofocus motor for D lenses. Yep, that's what I'm talking about. The Z9 is way too expensive. It got me all excited. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, Ron Durant's in. Hey, how you doing, Ron? That's how far behind I am on catching up on comments. I've just got to where Ron Durant just said hi. Let's see here. Bass Angler, I agree, Wolf. I wish they would have left the AA filter off. Ah, Phil's here. Hey, I was just talking about you earlier. I was bragging on you some more. Ollie says, um, besides, there is no point in a new adapter without the autofocus mo motor for many Nikon shooters. And that's that's my point. You know, um, Phil wants the Gen 2 without the bump because he wants to be able to change lenses without it hitting on the tripod and stuff. And I'm into that. That was one of the big problems I was seeing. Because I would tripod or put the Parker Swiss L bracket on the Z6 and then mount it on the on the tripod while the little clampy thing would go under that FTZ adapter and you couldn't take it off to put like a native lens on. I couldn't switch lenses until I dismounted it from the tripod. It's kind of frustrating. 
So I ended up a lot of times putting the tripod plate on the F to Z. And then you can't take it off the camera because then the tripod foot hits still. So, yeah, it was kind of frustrating. So I, I get why people wanted the, want the clean round one. It makes sense. But I do wish they would make that stepper motor one. That would be awesome. And they can do it. They've got all the tech and all the software and the firmware. They've got all that. It, it's all in their ethos. They could easily make that adapter. There's something preventing them from doing it, but I don't know what it is because they could so easily. Hey, everyone just came in. So Hassan left and came back, huh? Let's see. Wolf Dick. Doing good, buddy. And you? Oh, okay. You are up chatting. All right. Bass Angler is in western Arkansas. He goes out there and photographs the big elk herd and the bald eagles out in, on the Red River, I think, is his favorite photo areas. Yeah. Can find TZRs in 35.14 for Z in black, no silver, out of stock. I thought mine was silver, Phil, but I was wrong. It's black. I thought I got the silver one, but I didn't. But it does have a silver ring on the mount. <laughs> It's basically an M lens. Look how thin the adapter ring is to make up from the L mount to the back of the lens. It's literally maybe maybe two millimeters, maybe one and a half millimeters. It's not much. It's very, very close. So they've got basically enough distance to flange it. The Z mount has a shallower flange distance, so yours will be a little wider probably. Because I think it actually, the Z-mount holds the record for the shallowest flange to sensor distance. By doing that, that gives them the biggest range of spaces and aperture sizes they can work with. Ollie says, in his humble opinion, the Nikon 50mm f1.4D is better than the G-Lens. Interesting. I haven't shot the G-Series at all. Uh, I own a G, a G lens or two, but I've never had that one. Wolf Dick says Northeast Arkansas. Okay, okay. All right, so Bass Angler is taking care of that. They should make AA filters that can be on or off in menu. And there's no reason they there's no reason for them to, to not be able to do that unless it's. Unless it's the way they hardwire it, I don't know, but you you would think that, I don't know how the AA filter works. I'm, I've never looked that up, so I really can't sit here and speak on that. That may be something that if they install it, they have no choice but to write it into the firmware. I really don't know. But that's a good, that's a, that's a neat idea. Maybe that's something that they could try. I mean, it's a good, you, you make a good point. Maybe you can make they can make it where it's a removable module. Or, you know, I don't know if you can get it if you can put it further from the sensor and it still do its job, or if it has to be right smack dab or in the sensor stack for it to do it right. I don't know. Probably does. Probably has to be in the sensor stack. Silver Fang says, Grays of Westminster were talking about an adapter for screwdriver lenses and were convinced the adapter would be extremely expensive. I don't see it. I really don't see it. I don't think it'd be extremely expensive because stepper motors are stupid cheap. They're, um, and you would need a, a little tiny one or you could run it through a, you could run it through a worm gear and you could just, you know, you have one that turn really fast to build your torque with through a screwdriver deal. You know, worm gear inside the inside the adapter. There just has to be room for the physical motor. That's the big kick. You need that. You know, you got to make up the flange distance for sure. But you also got it would take it would either it be on the side or on the on the top. It would have to be somewhere. I don't think it would work on the bottom. I think it or if it did, there would be a tripod foot on it. You know, it'd be big enough. It would create some space requirements, but it, it could be installed in there. Because when you take it out of the camera, it's a little bitty thing. I mean, you can look at teardowns of Nikon DSLRs and see that screwdriver motor isn't very big. It's a little bitty thing. 
but it would just be expensive only if they wanted it to be I mean when you see if they can make this for 70 bucks and it be as optically clean as it is yeah I don't know <laughs> sometimes I don't know but Wolf Dick says, I didn't know you could correct the AA filter slight dulling. I don't know. They, maybe they can't. I might be. I could easily be wrong on that. So, <laughs> Randall says, says Silver Fame, they backed up from their earlier rumor. <laughs> Randall says they commented on it to, in today's report. Mm. Phil says black is cool for your Leica. ZFC needs silver. Yeah, as it does, it gives it the. It goes along with the whole retro vibe, you know. And the camera has got all that got all that silver on it. I really think you should have got the one with the with the brown leather coating. I think that would have been pretty cool. Well, for me, I would have liked it because this is a leather case deal. And it feels good in the hand, actually. I kind of like the leather coated um, doohickeys. <laughs> this is irony for you, okay? I've got it color matched. You can see it's all color coordinated. It's pretty. This uh, grip deal is made by Limbs. This is Italian, um, Italian stitched leather. You can see all the fancy stitching on it. Okay, this case doohickey was like $150. It was pretty expensive. But it, I justified it in that it has the aluminum grip. It has an aluminum subframe. It has the Arca Swiss plate built into it. And you can actually get to the battery memory card with it installed. And like the Leica one, which is kind of terrible to tell you the truth. Contrasting that, the strap... Cost a whopping like seven dollars off of Amazon. <laughs> it's a little, it's cotton cloth. You can't really tell, but it's starting to fuzz and it's getting like this broken kind of feel to it. You really can't see it because I can't get the lens to line up on it. But yeah, this thing is actually like seven bucks and it's like cotton rope. <laughs> and this is like, this is like some kind of cheap vinyl, but. I like it. <laughs> so, <laughs> this stuff that's kind of ironic. <laughs> spent all that money on that half case and then spent seven bucks on a strap. <laughs> okay. Runaway at Lars says he's so glad his Q2 has no AA filter in it. Yeah, I'll tell you though, if I was if I was really wanting to get into the Q cameras, I would I would really want that monochrome because they take the color sensor array off of it, that Bayer array, they remove it, and when they do, you can take the ISO up to ludicrous. Like you get good photos at fifty two thousand ISO. It's insane how good the ISO performance gets once you pull that color filter array off. Because you lose, it's like four stops of light for blue, is it? Each color, the blue, the green, and the red channels remove, you know, you lose light. Because it's like putting filters in front, of the, uh, in front of the sensor. And certain ones remove more light than others. I don't remember which one. I think it's blue. There's like four stops. It's some kind of crazy amount of light loss. So, yeah, I would be really interested in like a, Q, a Q2 monochrome. I'm not really big on the range finder thing though this looks like a range finder but it isn't this is an evf so i can still see the focus the range finder deal i you wind up i have to look through my glasses and the viewfinder to do the whole range finder deal and because of that i tend to put this cup against my lens and then that gets smudges on my glasses and i can't see with these i cheat I set it to my eye without my lenses and I look over them and I set it and I look through it above my glasses. That way I don't 
like get this uh, oil all over my lenses and I can still see. So I'm all the time shooting with my camera like that. I'm looking over my glasses. <laughs> but, you know, it's just uh, something I learned the hard way with my D810 was, was I was putting that viewfinder up against my glasses to look through it because I have astigmatism and it makes everything kind of fuzzy a little bit. So it looks a little out of focus. And how I fixed that was I finally just adjusted the diopter to my naked eye without my glasses. And when I shoot the D810, I just take my glasses off and I put them on my shirt. And that way I don't have the trouble. It removes that problem. But yeah, that's the only reason I don't mess with the M's or the Q's. I don't know if the Q2 and the Q are actually EVF or not, are they? I don't know. I haven't ever looked. But yeah, that Q2 monochrome, that's the one that I would like to have if I was going to get one. Let's see. Let's catch up. Hey, Wolf Dick needs to go find that elk herd. <laughs> yeah. You two need to link up and go shoot up together. It's always more fun when there's two of you. And if you get three in the car, you go storm chasing. Bass angler, I'm looking at you. Let's see here. It was still a lot of fun. <laughs> All it says, stepper motors are dirt cheap. Just look at 3D printers. Truth. <laughs> Besides, Nikon makes and sells stepper motors to the other industries and is a market leader in that regard. <laughs> when you manufacture the stepper motor. <laughs> Phil says, the brown one was my favorite as well. But it can only be ordered from the Nikon website. And they could not guarantee an early shipment. Oh, yeah, you were an early adopter. That's right. You got them on launch, or you ordered it at launch. That's true. You did the pre-order deal. I forgot that the color, all of them are the color leather red or whatever they call that, the um, new book, whatever the coatings are they put on it. All of them were special orders straight from Nikon, weren't they? I think they were. Runaway at large says, one thing I hate about my Q2 case from Leica is that there is no access to the battery or SD slot on the bottom. What is that even about? Why, Leica? Why? <laughs> it's the same way for the CL. That's why I got the lens. I was, I really wanted the grip, this little section here. You can see if I get it in the light right. That little extra little bit of grip makes this camera fit my hand perfectly. And I love that about it. And um, the Leica one, just has a little thing that juts up, and it's just a plate that runs across the bottom, and you have to take it off, completely remove it to get to the battery and the memory card, which is in here with the battery. You open that little door, and the memory card's right there, and the battery, of course, you know, and there's the battery. But, but yeah, same thing. And when I found this, and I seen it was battery and, and card accessible, I was like, dude, I'm in. It does add... Um, about a quarter of an inch to the bottom of the camera, which doesn't hurt me at all. I mean, it, it does give a little more grip area, but yeah, it comes down off the batter, bottom of the camera about a quarter of an inch, about six millimeters or so. But yeah, that's that's a good point. All the Leica grips are that way. I don't know what they're... They have engineers. <laughs> you know, it's like... It's, it's almost like they went down to the CAD lab and they said, okay... They pointed to a junior engineer and they said, design a grip extension and it has to have a little more mass here and it has to attach to the bottom of the camera. And they left. The guy's like, I can model that up before break. <laughs> he sends it out to the prototype department and they cut one out or 3D print one or something, you know, and then by lunch, they've got one on the camera. They're like, hey, that looks pretty good. We'll use it. I mean, <laughs> is that what happened? <laughs> oh, Mm -hmm. Oh no, is it? Phil says, Now I'm glad I got the black one because the black one matches my small rig grip. You mean all three of your small rig grips? <laughs> if y'all haven't seen Phil's adventures in small rigs lately, you should go back to the, the small rig unboxing live stream he done and watch it. And then he's got a couple more videos. And watch those videos because it's, it's hilarious. 
the the adventure in small rigs. That's what you should call that. Start a, a start one of those um, little groups of videos. What do you call them? Playlist. Start a playlist as adventures in small rigs. <laughs> Let people binge watch that. <laughs> Realizes, OMG, I am so tempted by the Q2 Monochrome. It is a nice machine, dude. But I'm a photo photojournalist, and I can't get away with just handing in black and white shots anymore. Yeah, I get your point there. Yeah, if you're just doing street, or you're shooting for yourself, yeah. Or maybe you had some kind of artistic freedom where you could shoot in just black and white. But yeah, it does. That limitation does cause a lot of problems for the professional industry. So there's that. George is here. How you doing, George? Just happened to catch this one, huh? I didn't. I, I failed to announce it, so it's not your fault. You get over here. Oh, I'm at the bottom. Let's see. Okay. Hey, I am caught up. Good. The Q2 is EVF. Okay. Nice. I didn't know that. I thought it had an optical viewfinder. Hassan says, I would love a full frame Lumix GX9 style camera. <laughs> Runaway says, um, just take my money. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, if they, if they just. <laughs> Maybe over the door. It's not complicated. I mean, it's a door. <laughs> Ron says, "Is that an L bracket?" No, it's just what they call a half case. It, the top is open. It just kind of drops down in it. That screw screws into the the uh, quarter twenty socket in the bottom of the camera, and then they give you another one beside it. So if you need a quarter twenty stud, but it's also got an Arca Swiss plate made into the bottom, but it's just an aluminum subframe that they've upholstered in leather, and then it adds this grip so that you got more of a grip. You can actually, you know, it it's actually a pretty good bit of grip, you can see. But yeah, it's only, but it's not an L bracket. It only has the one Arca Swiss. It don't have one up here too or down here. Got to go. Class is starting. Good to, good to see you, Wild Wolf Dick. Thank you for stopping in. Seriously, appreciate it. Have a good one. Let's see. Ollie says, when the graphene sensor comes out, it will be groundbreaking. In readout times and high ISO performance, it will make all CMOS obsolete. 1,000 times more sensitive to light. 1,000? Wow. Wow. That's insanity. <laughs> well, I'll be using ancient technology by then. That's incredible, dude. Seriously, if that's if that's legit, if they can get that to work, yeah. But what will that cost? How much would a graphene sensor cost? The official Q2 case does not have a tripod thread either. It don't even have a quarter 20 threaded socket on it. So I went out to get an extra long quarter 20 screw so I could mount it with the case onto a peak design back plate. Interesting. See, basically you had to, you, you run the screw through the peak design plate and the, the, the grip extension and then sandwiched them together just so you could have that functionality. Ron asks, are the colors in bloom yet down south? Not yet. They're starting, but we're at least a week out, maybe a week and a half. There's a lot of green still here. It's kind of shocking how long it's went. It's going to be at least Halloween before we see a lot of brown and red and yellows and stuff. But like I said, the dogwoods are turning, and I guess the poplar trees, they turn yellow. Poplars normally turn yellow. I haven't noticed them, but yeah, we we don't really we don't really see the colors up here on the mountain. Sometimes they change all at once, but a lot of times they change in stages, like the oak trees and then the poplars, and then the you know it's like weird. It's like they don't all die at once. He says things are happening up here. 
Yeah, one of these days, I would like to go out to like Colorado or Utah or Wyoming or somewhere where they have the aspen trees and get and get some nice landscape photos of a valley with a with two or three aspen trees where you get the different colored groves. I'd like to do that at some point. Runaway R says, where is down south? I'm in the UK, so down south means something else to me. But I do have a weak spot for accents in the US. I am in northwest Georgia, which is right where the Tennessee Georgia border meet in the state of Alabama. There's a little corner, and I'm in that corner of Georgia. I'm literally about one mile from the state of Alabama and about four miles or so from Tennessee. So it isn't very far. I'm just right in the corner of the state pretty much. Ron Durant is in South Tennessee. Oh, no, he's a middle Tennessean. Middling. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Up on the Cumberland Plateau. I technically am because Sand Mountain is a plateau and it's the last of the Appalachians. You know, there's an elevated region that's the Cumberland Plateau, and I'm, it's about the same elevation. It's a little shallower. Look out, mountain's taller. But, yeah, Santa Mountain is the last. It's the very end of the Appalachian chain as it tails out into Boaz. Look out, Mountain runs out, and, and Sand Mountain run out together, and they run into the plain down there. Kind of interesting. You can go further west and run into Skyline Mountain in Alabama. And then I don't know what's on the other side of the skyline. Are you rooting for the Braves tonight? Are they playing? That should answer your question. <laughs> Somebody said they're going to the World Series. But I haven't been following baseball in decades, so I don't know anything about it. I honestly haven't followed any sports in a long time, seriously. Of, of any serious consequence. I heard the other day that Alabama lost to somebody, supposedly. There were there were people speculating they were going to lose to Tennessee. I don't know if that happened or not. I need to. I could ask. Phil, you're here. You'll know. Did Tennessee beat Alabama this year? I don't know. Braves, Astros, game one. Game one is the World Series, so it's happening tonight. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea. I I heard that they were World Series bound, but I didn't know if they had, if that meant that they were going to the playoffs or if they were going to the series. You know, because sometimes people jump the gun. You know, if they go to the world, go to the playoffs, they'll say that. But well, at least they got the whole country back on because like nobody likes the Houston Astros. <laughs> I don't even think people in Houston like them. <laughs> I'll probably get a bunch of down thumbs because of that. <laughs> so, they, I don't know. I had no idea. I, I guess. I hope they win, I guess. Yeah, I had no idea. Interesting. If y'all haven't given me a thumbs up yet, I'd appreciate one. I'll just go ahead and shamelessly plug that. But yeah, I want to get out and shoot some photos. And I wanted to do my little unboxing on, on camera and share with you guys the how big it was. I was honestly thinking it was larger. From the photos, I thought it was bigger. I really did. But I knew it only covered a um, 1.5x crop sensor camera sensor. So it doesn't need to be very big. Even at f1.4, it doesn't have to be very large. So I was... I was kind of interested to see that, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Basslinger says, hey now, I'm a Rangers fan, but Astros are my second. <laughs> the Texas Rangers had, what was his name, Nolan Ryan. Wasn't he the super hot rod um, pitcher that pitched for the Texas Rangers? I think he was. That's, that's telling you how long it's been since I've watched baseball. Because he was like some kind of super pitcher or something. Wasn't that his name? Yeah, that was him. Okay. <laughs> George says, hope we can meet in 2022. Me too. I am about done with this whole epidemic thing. It's like, come on. 
Let's just turn it back on and deal with the fallout and move past it. I know it's going to cause problems. It's causing problems anyway. I'm beginning to wonder if the problems of trying to be super safe are starting to outweigh how they say it. If the medicine is more dangerous than if the cure is more dangerous than the disease kind of thing. You know, because it starts to mentally wear on people. I've been very fortunate. Where I am, it hasn't been near as restricted. There's other areas where it's been super restrictive, you know, like New York City or so there's even countries like Australia is having big problems right now. But, you know, um, so I haven't really felt the fallout from it like a lot have. But there's a lot of talk about serious psychological ramifications of, ha of having to quarantine for two and three years. And it's, and it's starting to be a problem. I mean, you're going to have suicide issues and all sorts of things come out of this. It's, so, yeah, I really hope that we get to move forward next year. You know, get this thing under control and move and move past it or whatever is going to happen is going to happen. But, I mean, I don't have the answers. I'm just a machinist from Georgia. You know, there's people that are way smarter than in viruses and pathology and stuff than I'll ever be. So, you know, take what I say and don't even listen to it. <laughs> I mean... But yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, right away, Lars says, hands up, UK is pretty bad. Yeah. Um, I watched several YouTubers from you from the UK, you know, and uh, Gareth, is it Gareth Danks? And uh, of course, Thomas Heaton. And um, uh, what's the what's the funny one? It ain't Jamie Windsor. I think he's I think he's British. I'm not real sure if Jamie Windsor is um, Sean Tucker, of course. Uh, what's the one that's funny? I can't remember his name now. I just watched one of his videos the other day. Daggum it. But they've all talked about the, the numerous lockdowns and, and how they can only go like within a, com a kilometer of their home or five kilometers or something. You know, it's very short leash they give you. And you can only go out to exercise. And, but, but yeah, that's, it's starting to wear on people. He pitched for both the Rangers and the Astros. I didn't know that. Interesting. Talking about Nolan Ryan. Yeah. Um, Ron Durant says, Phil, I'm charging some batteries. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I remember going to my first baseball game, and people there were so nice, although they did the whole, OMG, you're from the UK. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> Runaway at large says, the pandemic has been hell for me. I'm a photojournalist, and because of the pandemic, I've had less events to shoot outdoors. I've ended up diversifying and doing articles. Yeah. When you're a photographer and you're having to type for a living, yeah, that's going to be, that, it's like, you know, rub some glass in my eye. Okay, I feel better now. Man, that sucks. I'm sorry to hear that, dude. Alabama beat Tennessee last Saturday. Man, they had to that gum do that. Um, that had to be a miracle because they were losing like at some at two or three points. Somebody had a had an app that was sending them like updates on the game where I was at. I was in the fellowship hall eating after church, and they were they kept talking about this team scored and that team scored and this team scored. And, you know, so I heard a bunch of that, but I never heard the final score because I left before it all ended. Man, that, yeah. I'm lucky my riding is okay, but it sucks for a lot of people who couldn't get out and switch fields. Yeah, no kidding. Mass Angler says, just live your life fear free. You got to go sometime. Just get the afterlife part right and you're fine. There's truth in that, too. I mean, everybody's going to punch out for something. You kind of want to put it off as long as you can. But at some point, it's like I said, at some point, the fear is it's causing mental problems for people. My daughter is real interested in the mind. 
So she's all the time researching this sort of thing. And she, and me and her talk about it when we go have breakfast. And there's a whole, there's a whole demographic of people that are suffering severely from this. Like, well, it, it creates paranoia. That they're, they're terrified to go outside. You know, you, you start. They got a name for it when you when you're like a hermit. You're scared to just even leave your house. It's a phobia, you know, because you're afraid you're gonna catch it. And that that's starting to be a real big concern. God, my nose is itching again. But yeah, it's it's a it's a problem. It's a real problem. And you know, the flu pandemic of what 1917. It took them three years to get over that then and they didn't have the population density to continue passing it like we do now. So this could, this could take five years, six years. It could take a lot more time and people haven't really prepared for that because everybody was thinking it was going to take two weeks. You know, here we are two years in basically or a year in, it's just been a year. And, and it's, well, what's going on two years? This is 21. All of 2020 was shut down, wasn't it? We started in about April of 2020, so it's been a year and a half. Year and a half. But still, right away was agra, agoraphobia. That's what it is. Okay, yeah. But it, yeah, it's, there's like record spikes in those cases in, of, that, of that paranoia or that fear because people are worrying. They're scared. And I don't know. I don't have any of the answers, unfortunately. Like I said, I'm just a machinist from Georgia who likes to shoot photos. And like I said, we have been very fortunate here in that we haven't had severe problems with it to the point that they wouldn't let us leave our property and stuff. They never did that to us. So I really can't speak for those people because I didn't live through that myself. And yeah, I feel I feel a lot of pain for them. This bad. Forever is longer than seventy years. Good point. <laughs> Thank you, Bass Angler, for that moment of brevity. Runaway at large says, "I think we're literally still going for herd immunity here." Back when it back when it first started, I'm going to say April or May of 2020. Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you if you don't know who your favorite astrophysicist is, look up a bunch of his talks and just watch them. You'll be super entertained for a while. It, he's a great guy, and he talks about all sorts of interesting stuff. And someone asked him. How do we solve the pandemic? And he says, we don't. That the world we live in now, we can't contain it because of the, the speed at which people can travel. The time delay between catching it and showing symptoms is long enough. You can literally fly around the world a couple of times before you'll show symptoms. And because of that, it can continent hop so easily there's no stopping it. He says our our best solution at this point is for it to go endemic, which is the same as the seasonal flu and a cold and tuberculosis and the black plague and all the other terrible smallpox and all that jazz that we deal with now that we don't have to, you know, fear dying over because modern medicine can pretty much keep us from dying from it. There we go. I got it that time. <laughs> But that it's going to have to go endemic. And what that boils down to is you just live with it. You know, once they get the medical uh, industry to where it can handle an endemic number of cases, they'll, they'll dwindle down to a small percentage. And then they, you'll have that percentage pretty much indefinitely. You know, it'll be different people but you'll always have a small percentage of people that'll have it. It's just the way it is. It's how viruses propagate. You know, it's kind of bizarre, but it, it's just the way it is. <clears throat> uh, 
her other way says, I mean, as ridiculous as this sounds, the figures seem to potentially say we're going down that route. It means route in U.S. language. Record infections, but still relatively low hospitalizations and deaths. Yeah, and I think I think what we have mostly now is people are worrying about like infant children and the elderly. Those two demographics seem to suffer the most from it because they're not as strong as like normal people. I mean, I had it last year and I'm fine now. <clears throat> and I'm not, I'm not the pinnacle of health by any stretch of the word, you know, but, you know, I get it. Ha ah, voice typing is meant to be route, okay, <laughs> root, route, whichever way you say it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see it. Ollie says it's an invisible enemy. The threat can come from the people you love the most. The best way to divide and isolate people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I see your point. Like, I don't want my mother to catch it. She just had a stroke about a month ago. So, you know, we're going to stay away from her if we get caught with it. We pronounce it as root. Okay. Yeah, a lot of rock climbers here, if they're from the west, they'll say the word root. But typically, southerners say route. And I don't know why. You know, it's like a mail route, which is the direction you take when the letter carrier delivers mail. You know, um, paper routes. But out west, they say route. It's kind of interesting. Oh, gosh. Sorry to hear about your mother. I hope she's okay now, though. And recovered. She has recovered somewhat. She can walk. It wasn't a full-blown uh, permanent stroke, but um, she lost functionality of her left side for a while. Her arm still hasn't come back fully yet. Um, she still don't have hand, uh, what, fine motor control of her hand. She can move her arm, but she, she has to concentrate really hard, which basically means that her brain's slowly rewiring itself to do motor function she says she can feel her fingers again that came back and she can walk she um she kind of had to relearn to walk her left leg was weaker my sister moved back in with her so um, my sister is sitting with my with mama right now to make sure she's okay but uh, like she didn't really severely lose her left side or like when she smiles both sides work so yeah she, i think she's going to be fine I think her hand will come back with time because her arm has been slowly waking up, as they say. It started out when she was in the hospital, she couldn't even move her shoulder. And then by the time she left the hospital, she could pick her arm up and move it around some and, and like move her, move that whole, her whole left torso and her, and her, her bicep and elbow area of the forearm. She could roll it. She just couldn't run her fingers yet. So maybe she'll get it back. Who knows? Ron says, have a good evening, David. Good to see you again. Thank you for stopping by, Ron. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. We are an hour and 38 minutes into this 15-minute stream. I was literally going to unbox a lens. Let me show you the awesome, the, the, the super awesome owner's manual from TT Artisan. Okay. Brandy lens. They do a stitched, they got a sewn binding. I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually thread sewed into the binding. Well, the the stitching didn't bite. So it perforated. You can't really tell. It's hard to see because of the overexposure. But yeah, there's little holes all in through the page, but the thread didn't sew. <laughs> And they show you, I guess, how to set up manual lenses in your camera. And it's all in Chinese. There's a little bit of English at the bottom, but it's 
it's easier just to play with the lens and figure it out. I mean, there's two knobs, focus and aperture. It's not complicated. But yeah, <laughs> no, that's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. We always go over time as a bass angler. <laughs> there's a lot of truth in that. Mm -hmm. Runaway says, you know... We were talking about copyright stuff earlier. Did you know TT Artisans has absolutely nothing to do with Seven Artisans? The other manual focus lens maker? More. <laughs> They're riding on that artisan name hard, ain't they? <laughs> I didn't know. I thought they were like different divisions or maybe there's just different trademarks and made on the same machinery. They had no love for the manual, just for the lens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, yeah, the book was something they just felt obligated to put in the box, I guess. <laughs> they are absolutely not worried about that lens or that book. But, yeah, the box is super nice. I put it together wrong. It goes this way. I was, but I was, I was kind of impressed that the, the whole lens was $70. And the glass looks good. To look through the lens, it looks good. So, yeah, I'm curious to see how it comes out. And it comes with an L-mount flange. I didn't have to buy an adapter and figure it out. It directly fit the camera. So, yeah, I'm curious to see. But, yeah, if it don't if it don't produce um, image quality like I want, but it lets me get my shutter speed like I'm looking for for low-light shooting, then I may look at a more expensive version of this lens and get something with a little more light capability. Maybe if I can find an F mount nick or or something, you know, whatever I can round up that'll let me flange up to it, and if it does what I want, you know, it's gonna give me two stops of light. So we'll see. Looking forward to sample images. Yeah, I gotta get uh, I gotta get some time working on the working in the shop shops struggling right now because we got a bunch of people out for a variety of reasons and it's not just one of them is one of them is coronavirus but then you got one has a family member in the hospital my sister isn't isn't it coming in she's she works for us but she's not able to work on site because she's with mama and mama lives 40 miles away so she's staying over there then we got another person that doesn't come in yeah it's just we've been struggling Anyway, so sorry for making you run overtime. Whoops. <laughs> it's normal for me. Every single time. <laughs> hmm. Let's see. What have we got here? Oh, yeah. I still have my elk photo from last. Um, Last November, when me and Aaron done the Fellowship of the Aperture Ring, that's still I have used that that screen photo for a year. I don't change mine out every day. Some people change theirs constantly. I know I, I get one I like and I'll leave it. I got the crop just right to where it it puts the date and and the time right between his antlers. And I thought I'm just gonna leave that one. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, that was the whole point of the stream was to show off the lens. Shot with the CL? No. That photo was shot with the D810 and the 500 millimeter phase resonal and probably the 1.4 teleconverter. I typically will shoot that setup like that most of the time. I'll add that tele. And that makes it a 750 millimeter F8. And in light like that, it works great. But yeah. That's what that photo was taken with. Yeah, the CL is more for my streets or just general photography, like taking photos of the family on a trip or something like that. But I still, if I'm doing, if I'm, if I'm shooting photos of wildlife, I still get the D810 or that Z50 in that 500 millimeter. That's my setup for that now. Yeah, I think I think I'm gonna hang up the screen, guys, and go get me something to eat for supper right over there. But it's been a lot of fun. 
Yeah. Yeah, that was the point. I, you know, since it was a um, standard three by two image, I cropped it to the vertical and then moved the crop until I got that lined up. It took me two or three tries to get it to where it where it framed is framed the data like that. I had your crocodile picture for my for mine for a while. <laughs> nice. Gotta love something stealthy and full of teeth. <laughs> Bon Appetit, thank you. It was really nice to meet you. We'll definitely subscribe. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. We call it dinner in Chicago. Ha <laughs> hmm. That's kind of neat. See, dinner here could be supper, could be lunch. Doesn't, depends on what time of day you say it, I guess. Thank you, Bass Angler. Appreciate it. You guys have a good evening. And until next time, get your camera out, no matter what kind it is, whether it's non-expensive or expensive, doesn't matter. But get it out and go take a picture with it, all right? I'll see you later. Bye-bye. It's tea in the UK. <laughs> Good night.